Welcome to this NHK TV session. I'm Hiroko Kuniya. Let me first start out by introducing our great panelist. Um, on my right is Christopher Pisaridis. Um, he's the Regis Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, he's, ex he's an expert on economics of labor markets and is the recipient of 2010 Nobel Prize in Economics. Next to him is um, Dilip George. He's the co-founder and chief technology officer of Vicarious. It's a Silicon Valley startup, and um, he's a expert on the research of neuroscience and artificial intelligence, and he's building human-level artificial intelligence. And next to him is Yoshiaki Fujimori, president and CEO of Lixel Group in Japan. Lixel is a multinational group that provides housing equipment, such as kitchens and bathrooms and toilets. <laughs> and um, next to him is professor at MIT Sloan School of Management and director of MIT Initiative on Digital Economy. He is the co-author of The Second Machine Age. And lastly, but not least, um, Taurus, Taurus Lund Paulsen, did I pronounce your name correctly? Oh. Is, a, oh, sorry, is a minister for business and growth of Denmark. Denmark has incorporated what is called flex security to secure steady economic growth and employment at the same time. And this session is titled A World Without Work. Now, where are we headed? Um, an Oxford University study on the susceptibility of computerization of US jobs concludes that 47% of US jobs are in high risk category, meaning these occupations could potentially be replaced by machines in the future. There is still much, much debate on the likely size of the impact brought on by the technological advancement on work, but awareness is growing more and more that despite increased productivity and growing global income and quality of life, um, maybe jobs could and have disappeared due to creative new services. Before I begin the discussion, I'd like to introduce uh, to you two perspectives. One, from the Club of Rome in 1997. 1997 report says that increased productivity and falling prices is, quote, some way of achieving the goal to paradise. But the road to paradise <laughs> is beginning to look very much yeah. like the road to hell, unquote. Yeah. The question asked was that we are driving towards more abundance, but at the same time towards zero employment and zero availability of money for many people. Another perspective. This, is go back, this goes back to way back in 1930. John Maynard Keynes. He warned also about the widespread technological unemployment. But he had a very different perspective. He said, man's struggle for subsistence may be solved due to technological improvements. He saw that man, for the first time, will be faced with how to use his leisure time. So here we are going to be asking questions. Are we driving towards more and more wealth with less and less labor? And with policy, what policies and actions do we need to take to soften the impact on people? So let me first start by asking Mr. George. You are the cutting edge Silicon Valley um, startup who is trying to build artificial intelligence. How far have we approached close to um, the mind of the human being? You, oh. let, me just, let me just explain to the audience here that uh, his company beat CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA is, um, we, we was, it was thought that only people could recognize the distorted figures and the distorted numbers in computers, but artificial intelligence was able to beat that. Yes. What does that tell us about the latest? Uh, yeah, so there are uh, two perspectives. Uh, one is um, 
Artificial intelligence is uh, already very successful and is being applied in a wide variety of areas. And these artificial intelligences are uh, what we call narrow AI. They can, they can excel humans uh, in uh, particular areas, mm -hmm. but uh, those AI systems cannot uh, be general purpose, uh, can, cannot be flexible like human beings. So in the narrow AI area, we are making great progress, and we have already made great progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, even narrow AI systems can replace workers in, in those specified uh, areas. Um, we are working on what we call general AI, uh, building uh, machines that work uh, in a very flexible way like humans do and uh, have the same common sense understanding of the world as humans do and can reason about situations uh, and adapt to situations. And the basic premise is that uh, the brain can be understood. What we have in our um, head is nothing but a machine and it can be understood, and uh, machines can be made to work on the same principles as the human brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are still far away from getting all the way to the human level intelligence. Uh, it is hard to predict how long it will take, because mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, probably uh, half a dozen breakthrough breakthroughs mm -hmm. away uh, to get there, and breakthroughs are uh, unpredictable. Uh, but there is a lot of investment going into it, uh, a lot of smart people are working mm -hmm. on it, so it is it is not a question of whether it will happen, uh, it is only a question of when it will happen. Mm -hmm. Machines can now um, do the physical work. Yes. And you're saying that you're, you're developing something that can mimic the brain. Yes. And you said the key factor is prediction yes. forward. Yeah. So, so one of the things uh, that we did when we beat CAPTCHA was, um, so uh, there are uh, pattern recognition systems which can, which, which can uh, look at an image and say whether it's an A or B. But uh, we were one of the first to uh, even come back and predict the occluded portions of a character. So this is based on what you know about characters, what you know about letters, uh, predicting the missing portions of letters. And, uh, being able to make predictions is, uh, can be considered as the hallmark of intelligence. If you have good models of the world, uh, you are able to make predictions on what is going to happen next. Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to mimic that uh, in software uh, is one of the key breakthroughs that is required for uh, creating um, human level artificial intelligence. Before I go to the other panels, I have one more question to you. Because the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs just recently conducted the basic income create a thon. Yeah. Basic income is to provide uh, money to people, regardless of they are, whether or not they're employed or unemployed, so that they can have a decent living. Yeah. What was in the minds of the entrepreneurs that you thought that ne we needed to start thinking about basic income for everyone? Um, yeah, so we can go back to, uh, so one of the uh, famous quotes from Arthur Clark is that, the goal of future is full unemployment, so we can all play. Uh, this, is, this is a famous quote. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that if you can build machines like the uh, brain, if you can replicate all functions that humans can do, mm -hmm. then all the production can be done by machines. And then there's a question of what do, you, you know, what, what do humans do? And we can play. Uh, and, but uh, the, the basic rule of play that we teach uh, children is Everybody gets a chance. Everybody gets a share. You mm -hmm. take uh, you take turns, and uh, uh, ensuring that everybody is part of this uh, abundance uh, that is produced by machines mm -hmm. uh, uh, is an important social responsibility. And uh, Silicon, uh, people in Silicon Valley uh, are aware of it. They are they are also enabling the change, and they are also aware of the consequences of it. And uh, I would say that is the impetus behind uh, those uh, conversations. So they're saying that massive numbers of employment could be lost. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me go to um, Mr. Brunson. Um, you in your book, in your second machine age, you say that there will be few winners and many, many losers. What's happening to the labor market? So I wouldn't actually put it quite that way. Okay. Let, me, let me clarify. So it's true that you can that the technology is making the pie bigger and overall wealth is getting larger, mm -hmm. but there's no economic law that says that everyone's going to benefit proportionally. Mm -hmm. It's possible for some people to come out way ahead and others behind. Through most of history, it was a rising tide that lifted most boats. Mm -hmm. But in the past about 20 years, we've seen what uh, Andrew McAfee and I call the great decoupling. That is a continued growth in productivity. Uh, GDP is at an all-time high in, in most countries. We have more millionaires and billionaires than ever before, some of them probably in this room here. Mm -hmm. um, but um, median income, the income of the person at the 50th percentile, mm -hmm 
is lower now in the United States and many other countries than it was in the late 1990s. So the productivity has become decoupled. And part of the reason that's happened is that technological progress can be biased. You can have it biased towards high-skill workers mm -hmm. against low-skill or middle-skill workers. You can have it biased towards capital or labor. You can have it biased towards superstars or uh, and against other people who aren't superstars. Mm -hmm. So those are all possible ways that the technology can unfold. Mm -hmm. But I want to stress that Ultimately, what happens is a function of the policies we put in place, how we organize our activity, mm -hmm. the decisions that executives and individuals make. And there's no inevitability about this particular path. That is the path right. we've been on the past 20 years or so. And if we don't change, we'll probably continue on that path. But it's within our power to shift that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, it's, it's quite possible that we can restore a, a system that creates uh, prosperity for the many, not just the few. But you say the change is happening exponentially. The technological changes yeah. happening exponentially, our institutions, our organizations are not changing nearly as fast, mm -hmm. and that's part of why we're having these difficulties. And I think it's wonderful that, that, that uh, Dilip and many others are inventing better and better ways for machines to have more capabilities, but it's the responsibility of economists and managers and the rest of society mm -hmm. to find ways to keep up. You know, in the earlier Industrial Revolution, you mentioned how machines had automated muscle work mm -hmm. um, with the steam engine and electricity. Um, the rest of society adapted to that. We invented mass public education. Mm -hmm. We changed our social security system. We made a whole set of other changes, and that helped soften the blow. It was still very rough for many people, and not everybody benefited immediately. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we adapted, and we made some changes. We now have to make equally important changes in our institutions and our organizations today. And one of the reasons I think it's good that we're having this conversation mm -hmm. is that we don't want to hold back the technology. What we want to do is speed up our our human mm -hmm. capabilities, our skills, and our organizations to keep up with what the technology is making possible. So Mr. Pissaridis, mm -hmm. excuse me, you, you say that um, the global share, uh, the, the global income is growing, but the share labor gets is getting smaller and smaller. Therefore, inequality is rapidly rising. And mm -hmm. um, last year, I think you um, warned uh, the people here and uh, that uh, the wealth of the richest 1% would own more wealth than 99% of the population. And Oxfam just announced this week that it happened, mm. right? Uh, in my, I mean, my view about it is, is very much the one that uh, you just heard from Eric. The pie is growing uh, mm -hmm. bigger. There's no guarantee <clears throat> that um, everyone will benefit if we leave the market alone. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, if anything, we think that not everyone will benefit if we leave the market alone. So we need to develop a new system of institutions, new uh, policies that will um, redistribute inevitably mm -hmm. from those that the market will have rewarded um, in favor of those that uh, the market will have uh, left behind. Uh, now, having a universal <coughs> minimum income mm -hmm. is one of those ways, and in fact, it's one that I'm very much in favor of. Uh, as long as we know how to apply it without taking away the incentive to work at the lower end of the market. I'm also not worried at all about job creation at the unskilled end of the market because th there are many labor intensive services that we'll never be able to um, uh, automate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is the caring, nursing sector, um, uh, me medical sector. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't mean high level doctors, I mean mm -hmm. sort of nurses and those who look after, uh, given with the aging of societies as well, that would be a big job creation sector, however many successes there are in artificial intelligence or anything else. Uh, there, is the, um, there is the leisure industry, mm -hmm. which is labor incentive. You don't want to um, sit in restaurants and be served by robots. I, I think you never will. Or you don't want your food to be mm -hmm. cooked by robots. At least I don't when I go to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, and um, th th there, are, there are many sectors that are like that. Where we're going to miss out is where we're already seeing it in the United States, and then it will spread to other countries, which is the middle class, which, um, as was said at, at, at an earlier se uh, session this morning, is the big consumption class mm -hmm. uh, of the economy. So how do we ensure that there is enough demand mm -hmm. <clears throat> going out into the economy that will uh, provide the incentive for people to create um, uh, jobs uh, for uh, the majority of the labor force, and, and inevitably we have to <clears throat> confront the idea that governments will take a more active role. Um, I know, you know, currently there's a presidential campaign going on in the United States, and I know if one of the candidates gets up and says what I just said, 
you will lose the election. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have Scandinavian representation here. If uh, someone comes up in Scandinavian elections and says we are going to move away from that, and mm -hmm. you never hear the word redistribution again, he's also going to lose the election. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we have to educate, in other words, our public right. that we need it. Redistribution is not mm -hmm. a dirty word. I, I live in Britain. We pay more than 50% tax. Uh, up, uh, admittedly at high incomes, but even at the income of, the, of a mere professor at the mm -hmm. London School of Economics, he has to pay more than 50%. <laughs> but we're still happy living there because we see the money mm -hmm. being spent well mm -hmm. on the whole. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a good national health service. Mm -hmm. uh, we take care of, of, of poverty. Right. They're doing it even better in, uh, in, in Denmark and uh, the mm -hmm. other Scandinavian countries. And, and, and it is a, a change of institutions that right. we need to see. But but the problem is that all these changes are so happening very quickly and men have take a slower time trying to adjust to everything. And I would like to ask Mr. Fujimori, how are you as a corporate executive feel about the job security, you know, for the workers? You probably make rational judgment looking at productivity, looking at personnel cost, looking at the new systems. What is happening with the job security? You know, as the, the CEO of the company, that we always consider the, our jobs. And we, one side that we wanted to use everything possible to improve our productivity. Mm -hmm. If AI come in, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. You make it, we sell it, we use it, we'll make it more productive. Right. And also, uh, as of right now, that we have about 100 facil facilities in the world. We have lots of workers over there mm -hmm. with the highly productive machine that's coming up. I think we'll hit some blue colors as well. Mm -hmm. And also, not only that, it will hit some of the white color segment like marketing, HR, mm -hmm. finance, et cetera. But having said that, what we are worried about is not that, because we can always retrain them to do higher value added work for them so the company can all world prosper. What we are worried about is the disruptive technology. Disruptive technology or disruptive business model will overtake us. So the all company goes down mm -hmm. by those disruptive technology or disruptive mm -hmm. model. So we wanted to more think about a competitive strategy. Uh, we are competing with our manufacturers of our kind today. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, Delete may be competing us or maybe the Google may be overtaking us. So the business model will change dramatically mm -hmm. with all these AI and new uh, force industrial revolution come up. Mm -hmm. So we gotta catch up all these. The question is, would we have our disruptive team within the company, mm -hmm. or do we wanna be more agile to adapt to the change quickly? It's our company's choice, but CEO, our industry has to think more of those, mm -hmm. how to survive, how to improve our company. Mm -hmm. So the rational decision that each corporation will make is to be more productive and more competitive. Right. And even in your country, Denmark, you are uh, promoting small and medium-sized corporations to uh, increase rob rob robots, introduce them in for more highly intelligent uh, production facilities to increase competitiveness. but. You could get into a vicious cycle of, you know, um, automating less workers, less demand, and less purchasing power. Um, isn't this a big dilemma? It is. It is. <clears throat> it is also a concern, I can say. But when I uh, are traveling around in Denmark visiting companies, uh, some of the companies that are investing in automation, that kind of thing, they are in fact able to create jobs now because they will be more competitive. Denmark has, because of our very high taxes and that kind of thing, also for companies, we have been exporting a lot of jobs out to other European countries and even also to Asia. Mm -hmm. So I think for Denmark, in fact, uh, having this new agenda, that could be an advantage. But of course, some of the European countries, also in the EU, they will have a lot of pressure mm -hmm. because uh, some of the new technologies would uh, send jobs away. Before, um, Mr. Burleson, when productivity rose, um, companies made more money, they hired more people, 
And uh, even if um, people were uh, replaced, there were new um, technol new, uh, new businesses that were created. Mm -hmm. So um, the cycle uh, was not a vicious one. Mm -hmm. This time, do you predict that this vicious cycle could occur? I, I don't know. About, because I, I think are, are, that, I, are we going to be able to make yeah. new services I, I think for industries a, faster? I think that's a great question. It's something that we have to take very seriously. Because as I was saying earlier, earlier, I don't know for sure. And that worries me. Uh, uh, there's no guarantee that we're going to continue what we did in the past or whether we're, we're at a, a turning point right now. I think we want to try to do everything we can to try to encourage job creation and educate the workforce and do our best so that we can continue in, in the positive way we've mm -hmm. been in the past. Um, but there are some disturbing trends. I mentioned earlier about median income. Mm -hmm. Also, if you look at uh, new business formation in the United States, we hear a lot about the wonderful things happening in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the whole country, there's actually fewer new businesses being formed. There are fewer young companies. Entrepreneurship mm -hmm. is actually lower than it was 10 or 20 years ago. It's been, it's been falling. Mm -hmm. And that's a disturbing trend because ultimately, those new jobs are coming right. from entrepreneurs. It, it's the, the function of an entrepreneur is to think of ways of creating, taking technology mm -hmm. and combining it with uh, skills that humans have mm -hmm. to fit a, a business, a consumer need, mm -hmm. and putting those things together. That's what entrepreneurs do. We need right. more people to do that because the old jobs are being automated. There's no question about that. I don't know whether it's 47% or what the exact number is, but there's no question that many, number, many, many uh, existing tasks will be automated, and that should be a good thing as we replace some of those routine tasks if we can find the new jobs and the new industries and the new goods and services. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see us working harder on developing those and developing the skills for the workforce so that we can fulfill those. Um, because ultimately, that's, that will be the best way to provide for people is to have uh, people doing productive work. And that's, that would be my first option before we go to, to um, a basic income or other sorts right. of things, which we may have to at some point. Mm -hmm. I think we could invest much more in education and entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. research and development to reinvigorate the economy. Mr. Pissaridis, where do you see the areas of growth for the labor market? Oh, there's no doubt that they will be in the uh, service sector, and most of them will be in service. In the service sector that requires uh, lower skills of the traditional kind, but it will require better skills in um, human communication. Mm -hmm. um, how you uh, treat other being, I, I mentioned the caring sector in. Uh, in so it will be in, the, in the labor medical. intensive. They, 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 will, they will be labor intensive, but they will require skills that are very different from the ones that our uh, schools are giving uh, mm -hmm. uh, p people now. You know, they will be beyond this, they should be able to, they will be able to communicate better. Mm -hmm. um, their product will not be one that they will be producing alone in a uh, laboratory or, or or in an office. It will be more involving uh, other people mm -hmm. uh, more directly. So I'm all in favor of um, new forms of education or at least an adjustment in our educational systems that, that will give these uh, new skills. Mm -hmm. um, there, there will, of course, be jobs, and I hope there are jobs at the entrepreneurial level, because mm -hmm. it's through entrepreneurship that uh, we get the job right. creation and, and, and making investment more productive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the United States is falling. Of course, in Europe, that's rising much more. I mean, in Europe, we're behind where the United States is. I mean, startups is only now becoming a fashionable term in, in Europe, and many young people uh, are moving in that direction, including my own son, I should say. So I see the <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so, so I should say, you know, I, I mean, the very first statistic you gave about 47% of jobs will mm -hmm. be destroyed, and, and you panicked. I, I mean, you know, in China, in the 20 years between 1985 and 2005, I'm sure more than 47% of jobs were destroyed over mm -hmm. China. No one will say that, let's panic, you know, what's mm -hmm. happening to all these Chinese people. In fact, employment has, overall employment has stayed mm -hmm. the same, productivity has risen. but. Uh, but that's because the economy during that period was able to create jobs of the traditional kind, mm -hmm. manufacturing, uh, sort of export, uh, low-skilled export manufacturing. But, but so, what worries us uh, is that if um, entrepreneurs uh, create businesses, but are they going to be um, creating businesses that can absorb enough workers that were displaced mm -hmm. um, by the, the smarter machines, the smarter, smarter robots? Um, uh, Mr. George, my, what do you, what, what is, how do you say that? Is no, uh, because uh, machines will be able to do uh, pretty much everything humans can do. 
and uh, might even be better than us at doing those things um, because they don't get tired, uh, they don't have children to take care of when they go back home. Uh, um, so, uh, so they might be better at uh, many of those things, mm -hmm. and including, including, um, uh, you know, eventually, not not in the near future, mm -hmm. uh, communicating with humans. Uh, we might not prefer it. We might prefer communicating with a real human because we might we might consider mm -hmm. the robot to be fake. So mm -hmm. we might. It, it is not whether. Uh, the robot is able to do a good job of it. It is more like we prefer interacting with the human. So that can be a decision that we make as, uh, you know, as a society, mm -hmm. uh, our own preferences. Mm -hmm. But uh, my take is that, uh, no, machines will eventually get better than humans at many of these things. And we will be able to produce a lot more with much less human effort. And uh, uh, that doesn't mean we won't have meaningful activities. Um, so our, our definition of what is meaningful activity has changed over our history. Right? Um, TV career was never a career before, uh, and uh, that was we have new technologies, new careers, uh, and the probably what will change is the our uh, definition of what earns you an income, what earns your living. Uh, but probably our meaning of life, you know, or our self worth can be detached from how much money we make from our work, as mm -hmm. opposed to what we actually do for our own fulfillment. So you're saying we did detach our work and income. That could be a possibility, yeah. Really? Uh, <laughs> that's, a new, uh, that's a new paradigm. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the sense that you don't have to, uh, you don't have to work to get uh, a basic income. So that's one of the ideas. Uh, and, and you work um, because you like work, not because it's a necessity to earn a living. That could be, that could be a paradigm <laughs> shift. Yeah, I can see that kind of a future. I, I think it might be useful to distinguish the, 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 the far future from the near future. Uh, I agree with Dilip that, that eventually machines can do, will be able to do almost everything because of the, the amazing research. And, you know, ultimately, the brain is a machine. And so, so there's nothing, I don't think there's anything magical that would prevent technology from event eventually replicating most, if not all, of those capabilities. But that's a long way off. And I don't know, maybe, it's, maybe it'll mm -hmm. be a little bit sooner with, with the hard work of some of the folks that, mm -hmm. that are working this. But I don't think the, that's the immediate challenge that we're facing mm -hmm. right now. Right now, we're facing something closer to what we said at the beginning, that, that, that narrow AI and other technologies are very, very good, better than human. They're superhuman at the, you know, arithmetic, you know, mm -hmm. doing the payroll. You wouldn't want a bunch of human, you know, there used to be a job called computer in the census, uh, a bunch of human computers, you know, adding up the numbers for your, your uh, uh, paycheck every month. It's mm -hmm. much better to have a machine do that. And there are many tasks like that the machines are continuing to get better at, especially in routine information processing work. Mm -hmm. And that middle category that, that Professor Pizzeridis has mentioned is being very much affected mm -hmm. by automation today. So the immediate challenge isn't that all jobs are going to be eliminated. Mm -hmm. It's that certain categories of skills and jobs are becoming uh, automated. And, and therefore, the people who uh, make a living on those, they're having a harder time. Their wages and their employment prospects are being pushed down. At the same time, uh, this other types of skills are becoming much, much more valuable, and you're getting uh, superstar incomes at that part. So we're seeing this, this divergence and growing inequality in part because of technology. There are other forces at work, let me just be very clear. And that's the immediate challenge that we face right now. And so I, I, that's why I'm optimistic that we can do things in terms of retraining, reskilling people, and, and doing things in terms of inventing uh, new jobs still today. Someday, I think we'll reach that world you know, uh, the Star Trek economy where everything is done by the replicator and so forth. But I don't think that's what we're facing right now. And I wouldn't want us to take our eye off the ball about the things that we need to do mm -hmm. in 2015 and 2020 to transform the economy. Can you give us concrete examples of what most, most of the, 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 the jobs that could be displaced are yeah. more or less in the middle class yeah. arena, right? Well, many of them, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's more complicated. And I wouldn't want to put it all in one single right. dimension. Right. Uh, in our work, we've looked at, at a database called ONET, and we've come up with seven distinct dimensions that are, that are important. Um, but for the sake of brevity, I think that many of them are in that category. Mm -hmm. um, as Professor Prisciridi said, that there are many tasks that involve nurturing, caring, uh, persuasion, interpersonal skills that are very difficult for machines to mm -hmm. do quite yet. And there's a big demand for those kinds of jobs. Coaching, I wouldn't want to be at a, a, you know, I don't think my son would want to be at a football game and have the halftime speech to encourage them given by a robot. It just yeah, wouldn't right, be the right. same. <laughs> and the leader of a company has to be able to inspire her workers and be able to get people to um, buy into that. 
And also there's a lot of creative tasks in, in creating art, writing books and novels, scientific breakthroughs, a lot of creativity there. Entrepreneurship is a creative mm -hmm. task. Those also machines are very, very bad at this more complex, unstructured problem mm -hmm. solving. So I think there's lots and lots of things that machines cannot do, mm -hmm. some that machines can do, and it, we need to reinvent our education. Our education, let's think about it, is mostly focused on teaching people to sit in rows, follow instructions, memorize facts. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what machines are good at. <laughs> that's stupid for us to have humans do the same things that machines are good at. We should be teaching them those interpersonal skills, the creativity, the things that machines are not good at. I believe they are teachable, but it requires a complete reinvention of our education. Mm. But machines can learn much faster than humans, and I wonder... Not if, in those categories. Not in those categories? Not well. I mean, you know, I will never say never, <laughs> but, you know, the, the immediate challenge before us right now is that in, in those categories, it's, it's very hard to teach mm -hmm. a machine to be truly creative. Mm -hmm. uh, they can find simple patterns. They can recognize things, but to you know to come up with a new business idea, I, I think that's that's almost impossible for a machine to do. Mr. Fujimori. Yeah, yeah I can uh, give some of the example of the the demand the supply gap even today. Mm -hmm. That machine can do a lot of things as you mentioned, uh, in, in, especially in a corporate. So, so we don't probably need as much people as many people as mm -hmm. we have right now because of that. But on the other side, mm -hmm. there are lack of talents in the society, like elderly care, like a, a uh, daycare uh, or uh, a child care. Mm -hmm. So those care things that are totally lack of talents and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and supply right now, but especially in Japan. But they tend to be Japan, lower paid jobs. That's the problem. Yeah. So the whole society has to change. Mm -hmm. So if we know this era is coming, either to a higher degree or to a lesser degree, mm -hmm. it's coming. And I think we have to think about the total social architecture or social mm -hmm. system where we pay more those people like elderly care or child care so that their job is much high, highly recognized and paid for so that some of the jobs who are lost in the corporation because of the machine learning can switch their job to those things that highly valuable to the society. And, and I think government has to think about today for 10 years future maybe or 20 years future, but we know that day is coming and we have to take an action right now. Mm. Well, you know, I, I mean, you asked um, what kind of jobs would go with. I mean, you, you see them around us all the time. You know, I, mean, I can give you an example from, um, from our university, so I'm, I'm sure it, this holds for all, almost any company. I mean, like 20 years ago when I was doing research, maybe 25 years ago, I mean, I'm still doing it. I mean, 25, when I was doing research 25 yeah. years ago, I, I, we, we would write it, we would write something by hand, longhand on a, on a piece of paper and hand it on to someone that we used to call our secretary, then, you know, you know assistant. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, it would emerge as a, a typed paper. If you were lucky, a week later, mm -hmm. it would emerge. If you wanted to make an alteration, and have it photocopied, you have to wait a few more days and, and, and it will involve two or three people. Mm -hmm. They were actually people who were doing those jobs. Now all those jobs have gone, they disappear. Those are the middle level jobs. The, right. the people doing those jobs mm -hmm. had education, a lot of them had university degrees, mm -hmm. or if not, they had the one just below the university degree. Mm -hmm. Th those jobs have gone. But at the same time, in, in universities, we had, we had cleaners say that they were coming at 6 o'clock in the morning before we arrived to clean our offices. Mm -hmm. Those are still there. That hasn't been uh, mechanized, whereas computers have displaced the uh, middle-level jobs that uh, universities used to have. They haven't displaced the professors, and they haven't displaced the office cleaners and office managers. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the kind of change <laughs> that we're seeing at the, uh, mm -hmm. on, on a bigger scale. You wanted to say something? Yeah, because I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with uh, Fujimori saying that Governments and also politicians should look maybe five or ten years ahead. I think that that's that's a crucial question right now because governments like myself who like to get re-elected, and uh, that that's that's the kind of being a, a government. And some of these investments you'll maybe only see the success in a five or ten years a period of time. So the first thing that governments should be able to do is also to conf confront what's going on maybe in 2020 and 20, or 2025. And that's on a European level, that's the European Union, but it's also on the, some of the European member states. Uh, and when I try to, 
to raise a debate about uh, these issues in, in Denmark. Uh, lots of companies are saying, why not focus on, on tax or why not focus on, on that? Uh, and uh, I think governments and also companies should be able to discuss this with each other. Food decide. Elderly care workers are lower level of the workers. Government can decide that high level workers, if they're skilled. So a social ecosystem can change to absorb the, 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 those gaps. Mm -hmm. so it's, the role of government is very huge. To, to sort of ease the gap that people have to face in adjusting in the kinds of jobs that are available, I think Denmark has uh, adopted this system called flex security. Flex security mean very um, adjustable uh, hiring and firing policy. Mm -hmm. You have uh, good unemployment benefits and then good training. I mean, how effective has that been for people to change jobs and be able to, to adjust to the situations in the short run, I guess? Well, that's been a great success for, for many years. Uh, and, and different governments uh, have also been able to talk to companies and also labor organizations mm -hmm. about but it is necessary for Denmark to have uh, this competitiveness because we are paying quite much money in, 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 in taxation for, for this welfare system, also like my British colleague just, just said. Uh, so how we many have, years of unemployment benefits can you get? Oh, it depends on how, how long you've been uh, on, on, on the labor market, but you can get about two or three years benefits. Mm -hmm. And have you then also some... Some, some other benefits, you can even have, 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 have more uh, social welfare. But, but I think it is uh, crucial that, of course, if you lose your job, you, do, you should be able to come back to the labor market. And I'm, I agree on what Eric has, has just been saying, that we'll be able in Denmark, hopefully in the future, also to focus more on education because education is the future trying to give the unskilled workers a, a hope and also a possibility to come back to the labor force. And edu education for me is, is number one mm -hmm. uh, and that will be the link back to companies and also back to the labor market. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I could add on that, the, um, many, many, many countries that we had in Southern Europe in, in particular, they, Many governments think that if they protect the job, you know, employment protection, as they call it, then they're, then they're helping the, the, the workers. In fact, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. What the government needs to do is to protect the worker, the worker's income, is to find a way of guaranteeing a good standard of living of the worker mm -hmm. and leave the job alone, leave the employer deal with the job because employers are much better at knowing what kind of jobs are good and what's productive, much better than the government. Mm -hmm. and, and Denmark probably does it better than any other country. Mm -hmm. In, in the world, but that, that, that's the basic idea. The government gives security to the workers mm -hmm. and flexibility to the employer. Mm -hmm. And that combination is the best one in terms of adoption of new technology and adapting uh, to, new, uh, technology, uh, to new challenges in the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the challenge the government has to face is how to protect the income of the worker and the living standard mm -hmm. of the worker without creating disincentives. In other words, bring the worker back into a job in, in, in the way that uh, Minister Poulsen was saying. Mm -hmm. and, but th there's been a lot of research in that uh, field. In fact, mm -hmm. my research is very much along mm -hmm. th those lines. And, uh, and, and we do know how to, how to handle it. And, and again, Denmark, Sweden, um, Netherlands, I should say, they, they are handling it well. They, they are a good example for mm -hmm. other countries to follow. I wonder, oh. I just wanted to introduce a quote from uh, Keynes again. Mm -hmm. and he said that spread the bread thin on the butter to make what work there is still to be done to be widely shared as possible, which means like work sharing. <laughs> yes. You know, people share jobs. Or there's ideas like negative income, um, um, subs income tax. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean what, what do you think are the effective policies that could enhance um, decent life, but at the same time, allow people to, to move on to the next Well, I chapter. would build very much on yeah. what Professor Pizzoretti said, mm -hmm. is that we really face a, a, a fundamental choice. Do we want to protect 
the past from the future mm -hmm. or the future from the past? Mm -hmm. And by that mean, do we want to preserve the existing jobs, the existing industries, everything the way it was? Um, you know, you, and you see companies um, lobbying the government to mm -hmm. be protected. Um, Uber is having a lot of trouble in the United States and Japan, especially here in Europe, mm -hmm. to introducing a, a new way of delivering rides to people. And, and some of the owners of the taxis and the taxi medallions and the mm -hmm. existing services have been very successful in blocking it. But you can go through many, many other industries where that's happening. And there's a, I think there's an instinct for governments to, to you know, say, hey, we want to preserve these jobs. We want to hang on to the way things they are. But that's always, 100% of the time, a failing strategy. And whatever number of jobs gets automated, that's not the, where we should be focusing. It, it's actually good and productive for jobs mm -hmm. to be automated. What we need to be focusing is on inventing those new jobs and making it easier to discover and develop them. And as we do that going forward, we may find that, that there's more flexible work arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, when I talk to some of the people in the so-called on-demand economy, next time you take an Uber, you can, you can interview your, your driver. Um, I ask, are you being paid more? And, and many of them say, no, not really. But I'm much happier because mm -hmm. now if I, if I want to work on Saturday morning, I can work. If I want to take off a, a Friday afternoon mm -hmm. to be with my children, because um, many humans do have children they want to take care of, mm -hmm. um, then, then they, uh, they can do that as well. And they have much more flexibility. And it turns out to be a, uh, a plus for them. So there's these new ways are being invented that, that benefit the consumer, mm -hmm. uh, benefit the worker, and in that case, obviously, benefit the uh, investors, uh, uh, the uh, uh, founders as well. So th that's a possibility. Um, going forward, it uh, wouldn't surprise me if, as our living standards rise, we choose to have much more leisure, as John Maynard Keynes uh, suggested. He was a little bit off, and in, 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 in if you follow up on that quote that you were making, um, he predicted that by our era, people would be working maybe 12 hours yeah. a day. <laughs> Hours. 12, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a week, yeah. sorry, just a week, not a day. Yeah. A, 15 <laughs> hours a week. Yeah, yeah. some of us three, are three, three, hours three hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. Three hours a day. So, yeah, so, so yeah, um, and, and he, was, he was not right about that. He was, he was pretty much accurate about predicting how wealthy we, he would, mm -hmm. we would be, but I think he underestimated our uh, appetite for consuming mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the new things that have been invented. Right. But even holding that aside, it's certainly true that the work week is much shorter now than it was in uh, 19... 29 when he first wrote the draft of that, or 1870, it, it's been falling. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's mostly a good thing. You know, people can mm -hmm. spend more time uh, doing other things. And uh, as long as they are able to, to have enough mm -hmm. income to take care of their basic needs, um, that's a choice many people will make. There's another argument that, that if the changes are so fast and that people are not being able to adjust to it, should we control the pace of the, uh, the innovations? Um, should regulate? Probably not. We, I, I don't think that's a good idea to control the pace of innovation because uh, I don't know what the side effects are from that. And, uh -huh. uh, and I don't think that is a reasonable way to control uh, the pace of innovation, uh, uh, you know, how exactly to uh, make that happen. It, it's better to let innovation take. But do you want uh, to keep automating everything and bringing, you know, yes. taking a, uh, Yes. <laughs> yes. No, yeah. but as long as we do the other things. Yeah. Okay, yes. so, so let's just focus, uh, as I was saying, yeah. on, on protecting the future from the past uh -huh. and, and, and have that. And, and look, what are we talking about? We're talking about a world, let's just be very clear, yeah. a world with a lot more wealth uh -huh. and a lot less work. Uh -huh. Shame on us if we call, think that's a bad thing. I mean, that would be, that's just weird to think that that's a bad thing. It should be a good thing to be able to have more wealth yeah. with less work, but we have to do it in a way that we distribute things it's scaring equitably. Everybody. It, it, and <laughs> understandably, because right now our current system isn't letting people share it. It's been benefiting the few, not the many, but it doesn't have to be that way. That's not, that's, there's nothing fundamental baked in. Those are some societal choices that we can make. Shame on us if we don't it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And shame on our politicians if they're not brave enough and get up and say that yeah. and, and, and say, this is what I'm going to do and vote for me. This is a group <laughs> that can influence that. Mm -hmm. right. But, you know, most of the government today tends to block the new things coming in. So I would go the other way. The government should accelerate even mm -hmm. those new things coming up and disruptive technology being replacing existing technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, most of the countries are tightened much more regulations and they are more protective mm -hmm. from those new businesses taking over existing businesses. I don't think it's the bad, I don't think it's the right thing to do. So the, the Japan is the same way and in the other countries the same way. I think government should relax all these regulations to allow new businesses to, to emerge. But Mr. George, isn't it true that some experts say that uh, 
people who can be hired by the new un entrepre uh, entrepreneurships are those who are immune to unemployment to begin with. Um, and only those who are <laughs> immune will be hired. Uh, well, I, I think one, uh, technology can help uh, retrain people and uh, also um, people plus technology mm -hmm. uh, can be uh, a very powerful combination. Mm -hmm. Um, plus, I think everybody has the every human being mm -hmm. has the ability to be creative, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, whether whether it being uh, on entertainment side, uh, you know, crafts, mm -hmm. uh, thinking of new ideas, exploring the rest of the universe. Uh, mm -hmm. um, um, so, every human being has the capability to be uh, creative, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we are creative when our basic needs are met. Uh, and uh, for example, I wouldn't be an entrepreneur if I was worried that if you know if I fail, mm -hmm. I will starve and die. If that was the outcome I am facing, I mm -hmm. wouldn't dare to be an entrepreneur. I wouldn't take to take risks. And I think that's that's a future that we can give to everybody. That mm -hmm. uh, you know, people's uh, uh, basic needs are met, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they all have the capability to be uh, creative. Mm -hmm. in, in Denmark, I think is leading the way on a lot of this. I mean, what you were describing with flex security mm -hmm. is a great example mm -hmm. of how you can have jobs, people moving from job to job, but mm -hmm. still have that safety net. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah, but but, but maybe uh, I'd like to return to, to Uber because I think that that's a, mm -hmm. a great example mm -hmm. because in Denmark we have quite much uh, regulation, I must say, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not uh, in, in favor of that. But the reason why we have made so many laws and also have so high taxes is the welfare system. Mm -hmm. But talking about Uber, and, and I'm in favor of, of, of Uber, I, I think this would be a huge company also in Denmark in the future. But when I'm talking to taxi companies, mm -hmm. and then they ask me, how can you make sure that Uber also would pay tax? Because they are not a part of the system. Because it's ordinary people driving around. Nobody would mm -hmm. control if they're paying taxes. Mm -hmm. So there will be a, a huge discussion in Denmark how to secure that the n new so, ways so, of living, that they will also be a part of, of the welfare you know, it's system. It's interesting you mentioned. I, I had a conversation with some of them, and they were talking. In, in some countries, it's, in Denmark is not so much one of these, but some countries is mostly a cash economy. And people pay their taxi drivers with cash. Mm -hmm. And do they pay taxes? No, they don't. Uh -huh. But when they, when they go with Uber, they have no choice. They pay with a credit card. All of that's recorded. So in many cases, it's bringing it into a part of the economy where the taxes can be paid. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it actually could be helping on that dimension. I think in Denmark, people probably already are using uh, cards anyways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the question is, which creates more jobs? You know, you know, protect taxi drivers, or if you open up, you create probably ten times more jobs. No, but I'm not protecting. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm, I'm just yeah, trying to, to, to give us some dilemmas in, in Denmark right. about mm -hmm. this issue. Mm -hmm. Also concerning Airbnb, that has been a great su success mm -hmm. in Denmark, a huge success worldwide. But of course now hotels and, and that kind of companies are coming to me saying, oh, it's not a fair competition because mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the same regulations mm -hmm. that we have to fulfill. I wonder if there is possible to have uh, innovation that can collaborate it with uh, mm. the human sort of uh, uh, aspects that humans are good at and amplify that at the same time allow the innovation to move forward to bring those qualities of human um, uh, talent and robotics together. I mean, do you see such so, sort of entrepreneurship rising or possibilities? I, I think that that's, that's a great thing for us to focus on. There's a tendency to focus on machines substituting for humans, mm -hmm. but machines can also complement humans. And many of the great technologies, mm -hmm. I mean, think of um, when, the, when airplanes were invented. Mm -hmm. um, before that, there was no need for pilots, but 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 to, to fly an airplane, you need a pilot, and mm -hmm. so that became something that augmented our ability. We we couldn't fly before. Now, with a machine and a human together, mm -hmm. we can fly. So that that's that's impressive. Going forward, you, there are things. Um, I was talking to some people just earlier today mm -hmm. about using Google Glass um, and to have what they call augmented reality, where it can mm -hmm. give you guidance, so that if you are a plumber or you are repairing a car mm -hmm. or you're doing surgery or whatever, it can overlay some of the guidance so that you do things correctly. Mm -hmm. um, even nurses may be able to do things that they previously weren't able to do, um, new sets of skills, by having the machine augment them. And it, it, instead of 
replacing labor, it makes labor more valuable, allows uh, workers to do new things. And there are many other examples where machines are complementing humans, and, and the more we see of that, mm -hmm. the more we'll see wages going up instead mm -hmm. of down. Mm. Can you try to, should we try to sort of um, have policies lead towards that than just Automating. It, 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 it's difficult, but let me just, uh, in, yeah. in terms of the policies, I, I think one of the things we do right now is, is we tax labor very heavily. Mm. And so if, if you're an entrepreneur and you have, uh, you have $2 billion ideas and you're trying to decide this billion dollar idea or that billion mm -hmm. dollar, dollar idea, this is a problem a lot of people have mm -hmm. in, some, some in Silicon Valley. Um, <laughs> Then uh, the way it currently set up is if one of them hires uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of workers, there's a huge tax burden associated mm -hmm. with that. There's a whole set of taxes that are associated with and, and benefits and so forth. If the other one requires no workers, mm -hmm. then you don't pay those taxes. So the government right now has their, their thumb on the scale saying, we're going to penalize the business that creates a lot of jobs and not the other one. And so that's probably not what we want to do. If anything, we'd like to do it the other way around right. with, say, like an earned income tax credit mm -hmm. that rewards people for cool. working and creating jobs. We can also do things in the private sector. Um, at, at MIT, we have created something we call the Inclusive Innovation Competition, mm -hmm. where we are um, launching now, and it'll be, uh, uh, the winners will be announced in, mm -hmm. uh, in September, mm -hmm. uh, people who, uh, companies and, and innovations that are using technology mm -hmm. to create shared prosperity as opposed, as opposed to narrow prosperity. Mm -hmm. And we think that by spurring more innovators and more entrepreneurs to do that, mm -hmm. we'll invent a lot of new ways of doing that. Um, just as, as uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge invented, helped invent the self-driving car, right. um, we're trying to do that for business models. Right. On the, on the taxation, I mean, I was taking it away a little bit from our main topic, but uh, switching from uh, from labor tax and income tax to consumption tax would be would, would deal with the problem, mm -hmm. and and it's not it's not difficult to monitor a consumption tax. You you know, just like now we declare our income and we pay tax on our income, we'll declare our savings as well and we'll pay tax on the difference between income and savings mm -hmm. as a consumption mm -hmm. tax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fujimori, you're, you've been talking about we should, you know, deregulate and try be able to try to do um, incorporate innovations. Um, other than that, what should corporations start thinking about with regard to this employment? We have to, uh, you know, we talk about a lot about retraining, mm -hmm. and retraining is responsibility for the corporation. Mm -hmm. If we know the future. And I think we're almost crystal clear that we know the future. That's mm -hmm. what we're talking about, that we have to start to retrain the people. Mm -hmm. And also, we have to work with the government mm -hmm. to really uh, create the future talent to be more adapted to the future trend. Uh, so if we need more of digital science or, or a cognitive science, mm -hmm. that we have more education to generate those people mm -hmm. as opposed to the traditional electrical mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. which is not going to be a major force in the engineering side of it. Mm -hmm. So the education, but what the corporate can do mm -hmm. is to retrain them to be more innovative, to be more a uh, creative, so that a creativity and innovation can match with the technology advancement mm -hmm. that the leap and network has been talking about. Mm -hmm. Eric, you talk about in your book that uh, communities where people are working are much healthier. Mm -hmm. Although we've been talking about what's wrong with more and more wealth with less and less labor. Mm -hmm. But communities tend to be much more healthier mm -hmm. if people are working. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and this is one of the things that, that concerns me. Uh, Voltaire put it, it very eloquently. He said, uh, uh, work solves three great ills, mm -hmm. boredom, vice, and need. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been mostly focusing on the third one, the need that work will provide income. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a way of giving people a sense of meaning and keeping them out of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and the data show, I was very influenced by uh, Bob Putnam, uh, a sociologist at Harvard, who described that when uh, communities lose work, you see drug use go up, alcoholism, uh, teen pregnancy. There's just a whole set of negative social indicators mm -hmm. as people uh, uh, lose faith. And the, perhaps the most disturbing one I just saw just came out a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. um, Ann Case and uh, Angus Deaton did a study looking at what was happening to the mortality rates of uh, uh, lower and middle skilled educate, uh, 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 
white Americans, mm -hmm. especially males. And while mortality had been improving for everybody for, for most of the century, mm -hmm. about 15 years ago, it started getting much worse for that particular group. Mm -hmm. And it's not just general mortality, it's specifically suicide, alcoholism, drug use, uh, liver failure, things that indicate that maybe uh, these people are feeling very depressed, perhaps in part because uh, their job prospects mm -hmm. are getting worse. So I have a comment on that. Uh, that's a study of the society as it exists now, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, the majority of people are employed, mm -hmm. and the minority are unemployed, and they feel left out, and mm -hmm. they will feel depressed because <coughs> socialization is part of employment. We also go to office to meet people and have social life. Uh, and uh, the social life is tied very closely to employment right now. Mm -hmm. uh, there are cases where, you know, some Greece, uh, Greek islands I read about where people work much less mm -hmm. and they have they spend more time on social life. Uh, and, and if majority of people are doing that, maybe the um, the adverse um, um, effects of not having to work uh, will go away. Uh, it's, I think it is connected to the social interactions. The more, more social interactions we have, mm -hmm. uh, healthier we are. Uh, and probably, currently, the unemployed uh, are left out of the social interactions. Mm -hmm. I can add more on the diversity side of it. Mm -hmm. Especially in Japan and in some of the countries, there was still not a accelerating this diverse culture. Mm -hmm. but if the productivity goes much higher, mm -hmm. and let's say anybody can do the work, the same work, in you know, like a 60% of what they spend today, mm -hmm. they can more focus on childcare, they're more focused on what they can do together to uh, generate more population. I mean, you know, that, that would help the, uh, the accelerating diversity as well as maybe for Japan, declining population. Mm. So, so I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to think about uh, sharing prosperity also, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and this is where government has a very active right. role, uh, yeah. role to play. Yeah. Mm. There's no other way yeah. of doing it. <laughs> well, this session is on um, a world without work. So I'd like to ask the panelists, what's going to be determining whether or not we will have a world without work or not? Anybody want to go at this? <laughs> what's going to be the determining factor? Well, let me tell you what it's not yeah. going to be. What? It's not technology. <laughs> it's our choices of how we use the technology. Uh -huh. Technology is and always has been a tool. We have more powerful tools now than ever before, mm -hmm. which means we have more power to determine what our future is mm -hmm. going to be. And we should never forget that, that, that ultimately the choice is in our hands and uh, it's going to be in the choice of the, the politicians and the people who elect them and the people who influence them, many of them uh, in this at, at Davos uh, this week. So let's just remember that ultimately it's our choice, not something that happens to us externally. Okay. It's our choice there. Te uh, technology will probably um, and high productivity will probably give us um, fewer hours of work mm -hmm. overall, but not necessarily fewer employment. I mean, we didn't say anything about the Netherlands. Uh, they have, if you look at annual hours of work that are mm -hmm. performed in the uh, Dutch labor market, you'll mm -hmm. see that it's one of the lowest in Europe. Mm -hmm. Their employment level is one of the highest. Mm -hmm. They found a way of indirect uh, sharing uh, that labor, and, and it's also one of, the, one of the countries that shows one of the highest jobs at job satisfaction levels in, mm -hmm. uh, in surveys they're doing. This, this is one way of, uh, of sharing work. And, um, and in fact, I'm very disappointed to see mm -hmm. many, a lot of the American literature. You know, recently I was reading a book by a very successful startup mm -hmm. in, uh, in California, criticizing Europeans for being so lazy. They take six weeks vacation mm -hmm. and they only work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 35 hours a week. But, but in fact, that, that's the future. That's what ensures that we're sharing prosperity. Okay. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.